Hello and welcome to a very special live stream. I'm gonna finally start putting stuff onto YouTube. So today what we wanna do is we're gonna model a Titan. Uh, this is the, one of the colossal uh, beast Titans from the show Attack on Titan. And we're gonna try to model this character. And then once it's modeled, we're gonna also try to rig this character. Once it's rigged, we're gonna place this giant into some real world, real world footage I shot on my iPhone over the past few months. So here's some of the footage. And I wanna kinda of show you my visual effects pipeline. So this one's not really an augmented reality thing, but much rather how do you like put, how do you take footage like this and put like a giant monster in? in First off, you're gonna be surprised that this program here is actually free. This is not ZBrush. This is called ZBrush Core Mini. ZBrush Core Mini is a free version by the company that made ZBrush. It's a completely free, zero 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 dollars but it's limited it only has the most basic and most popular um animation uh sorry most popular 3d sculpting tools and so that's why i wanted to use it um i also have down here is a um, i never use it very often but since we're going to be sculpting this is a pressure sensitive um, touchpad thing so we could like you know you can draw on that on this thing and uh, create all sorts of you know mass and and whatnot onto your 3d model so I just wanted to point that out because that's what we're going to be using today. So let's get started. We're inside of ZBrush Core Mini. And I have another tool up here called Pure Ref. Pure Ref lets you put um, footage, any stock footage and like uh, reference art, it hovers in front of your screen so that no matter what program that you have open, you're able to reference your artwork and not have any problems. So uh, yeah, it's just a really nice tool. So let's, um, let's get right to it. We're gonna make the Colossal Beast Titan. Uh, I really like this particular art piece on because we get to see his full body in the shape. So let's get right to it. First thing we wanna do with our uh, core model, oh, I'm just gonna make the height a little bit smaller here. Uh, the first thing we wanna do with our core, our core model here is, uh, is block out the main, main forms and literally just in big blocks. So I'm gonna grab the move brush I'm also going to enlarge that brush diameter to be significant. And we're gonna create the mass of that character. Uh, let me see, so this is a piece of clay essentially, and we're just gonna model that body of the Colossal Titan. So he's got a very long, wide torso. And we're just gonna kinda of pull on the geometry here. And then uh, we'll make legs and stuff. I'm just gonna do his upper body first. Cool, so just gonna give him a little bit of a belly here. Great. Again, we're just talking about rough blocking of our character, just the main forms. This is the body. I'm looking at the torso right now and kind of just trying to create that main core torso. Let's look at some other side references because um, I got another side reference here. So this is helpful. Some other people online have already illustrated this character. So it's really helpful when people do that because I can use it as reference artwork. So I can just pull on the character's belly and give him more of a butt cool and just kind of pull on that mass as well great let's kind of round that belly down a little bit more cool 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 again this program i'm using right now is called zbrush core mini it's free it's literally free you don't have to pirate it you don't have to get a computer virus trying to find some free software i'm using zbrush core mini because it's free and because i'm trying to make my tutorials a little bit more accessible now that being said i'm not going to be using free programs the whole time but at least for now, in this early stage of creating our main character, uh, we have the ability to do it on a free program. Oh, I won't forget to save. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, let me go save. Where's my save? Save project as. And then I guess I'm gonna save this to a new spot in here called Beast Titan. And I'll just save that there. Cool. All right, so now I'm gonna use the snake hook brush. It's really good for pulling out um, very specific chunks of geometry into like these little snake-like noodles. Uh, it's great for kind of making arms and legs, at least roughly, of course. This character has extremely long arms, which you'll see in a moment. Um, I might actually make the arms, I might pull the arms down first, just so I get the right forms and get the right length of the arms in there. Cool, cool, cool. And let's kind of zoom out of our shot here. Okay, I'm just making sure I remember how to zoom out. Slightly different controls in here than Cinema 4D, so I'm trying to remember what hotkeys do what. How do I pan? How do I pan? How do I pan? There it is. Okay, so Alt right mouse button is pan. Alt right mouse button drag is zoom. 
Yes, thank you so much, Pug. I will pin that. Yes, this is ZBrush Core Mini, and I will reiterate, this is a free program. Finally, a free, like legitimately free program. I'm not kidding. And that's rare with me, because I'm always using these paid programs because they're powerful, but I won't lie, when there's a good free program, I'm using it. Cool, all right, let's give him a little tiny head here. So I'm gonna use the clay buildup brush and we're gonna zoom in. How do I zoom? Oh yeah, there we go. And then how do I pan? There we go. So we're gonna zoom into the head here and just give him a little shoulder mass here and just kind of block out a neck. Actually, that's pretty roughly the shape of the head there. He's supposed to be super, super, super giant. So we're going to keep him kind of on the smaller, keep his head proportions small compared to his body because the character is, is huge. All right, cool. So we got some rough form made. Uh, now we're going to add more details. So we have this tool called the clay buildup brush, and you kind of just can use it to stamp like clay onto your model. So I can just give him a little bit more leg mass. I'm going to reduce the Z intensity. So we can just uh, apply like some little muscle mass to the legs here. And let's give him some actual calves in the back. It uh, looks like we're losing some volume, so I'm going to use my inflate brush and just literally inflate the legs so we get a little bit more volume to play with. And now that the legs are inflated, I'll go back to my clay buildup brush and just add... Interesting, I'm not able to add more clay here, so I might grab the Z polish. Um, it might help to show you this, that if we turn on our polygons, you can see where it's adding de um, texture density. Oh, question from looking up right now and it looks interesting yeah zbrush core mini is the program i'm using right now to model this and i'm going to reiterate it a lot of times throughout the live stream this is actually a free program it's made by pixel logic and the reason why i'm using it instead of zbrush is first off i don't have zbrush uh, my license expired so i used to have it but i didn't use it enough so i didn't i couldn't justify spending all that money again when i'm not really using it but they recently, as of just like a month and a half ago, offered this free version of ZBrush called ZBrush Core Mini. And the main difference here is that it's, it's like a baby version of ZBrush. You can't do most of the tools, but you can do the core tools. And that's all I was really using anyway. So I figured, wow, I can just get like ZBrush the way I need it, essentially for free. And I say essentially because they want you to like upscale, right? They want you to always you know pay for more but you don't have to if you're smart you can just use the free version where it's good and then apply a you know a different version somewhere else so I'm only going to use this to kind of make my main forms of my model so you can smooth out the model by holding shift so you see how I, I add mass like to his belly and then I hold shift and it smooths out that geometry and it's uh, it's really nice how much you how much you can add you know details to your model very quickly all right, I'm going to pull into here and see a little bit closer look at his mid-torso and body. It's a very creepy creature, and so I want to make sure I get that. So he's got a lot more mass in the fronts here. He's got, like, love handles. And then we're going to grab the, uh, the, the clay buildup. I'm just going to rem uh, remove some material from the sides here and then smooth that out. And do the same thing again. just going to remove some mass here and then smooth it out. Cool. And then let's give him some chest and then smooth out that geometry. Um, if you're good at anatomy, you'll be great at modeling stuff in 3D. I got my model, my main model made. Next, we need to take this into the next program where we can do a clean model where the geometry isn't like a trillion polygons. So what we do is we go to the export options at the top here, export for 3D printing, and I'm going to save this out as an object file. So we'll call this um, high underscore res. Oops high underscore res titan and we'll hit save 
Cool, that just exports the model out of here. So I'm gonna minimize ZBrush, and now we can open up Cinema 4D, where we'll do the next level of processing on the character. We finished modeling this character inside of ZBrush Core Mini, but the model is very dense. It's made out of about 300,000 polygons, and if we ever wanna bring this into a, you know, a cool video to make it like an effect, we're gonna to need to reduce the polygons so that we can paint this and get this all working. So, where are we at? We're here. And uh, we tried to do with the remeshing tool, but it wasn't very clean. It, it, would, it would remesh the model, but then we would lose a ton of resolution. So instead, what we're doing now is I'm going to just try a different method for reducing the polygon count. And hopefully by reducing the polygon count a different way that hopefully it's just a little bit more manageable. So I'm going to copy our asset. So we got a copy of it here. I'm going to hide the copy. And then with this copy, I'm going to go to the tools at the top here under, uh, let's see what we got. We can go to the, uh, the, the polygon reduction tool. So we click on the green button. We go to polygon reduction. And I'm going to make my object a child of the polygon reduction. And this is running an algorithm that's going to calculate how many polygons there are and then procedurally allow us to change the number of polygons with a slider. So let's get that going. Cool. It looks like it's working nicely. Uh, we now have a, a reduced model. And actually, it's not that bad in terms of the resolution, but we have a slider. So we can control the resolution of our polygon mesh with the slider. So it's at 90% reduction. I might just reduce this to like maybe 80% reduction or something. Let's take a look without that. That's 80% less polygons. Sorry, that's 75% less polygons. And we're getting a pretty good, um, we're getting a pretty good shape here. So that's a, that's a reduced model. Uh, let's compare it to when it was on. Uh, let me turn it off and on. So yeah, you are gonna lose a little bit of resolution, but, um, but the difference that you get is that you're able to actually texture with it. You can actually bring in your model with lower res and cool. It's a generator, so we can also reduce it less or more. So that's like reducing it to the maximum. That's a 97, that's 97% reduction. <laughs> this is if I was on like a old Game Boy and I needed to get this to work. Um, but we don't need to go that low. So I'm gonna increase the res a tiny bit. This is at 75% reduction. Again, not bad. Uh, I think we'll work with that. So that's 75% less. So let's, let's bake that down. We'll convert this down to an object. And now that we have a lower res model as like a starting point, we now can do other stuff with this. So I can take the Fong angle and increase it. And just by taking that Fong angle up, we actually smooth out a lot of that geometry. So it already looks a little bit better, even though it's lower res now. If we select how many polygons, this is actually totally manageable. This is at 70,000 polygons, which is a lot less. This, we had its initially this was at 300,000 polygons when we modeled this and now we just got down to 70,000 that's a huge difference so i'm really happy with that so i think we might be safe to do some uv unwrapping now so let's let's do that we got our model reduced so let's go ahead and display our geometry all these little triangles are the polygons and what i'm going to do is try to remesh this now that it's reduced so it's a smaller calculation so I'm gonna grab all of the model here, and then we're gonna go to the extensions, the quad remesher extension, it's about 100 bucks, and I'm gonna try to reduce this, so it's at, it's at around 70,000 polygons, which is great. Let's see if we can just put this around 70,000 again, but this time we keep it as squares that are adaptive. So I'm gonna make it a adaptive sizing at 88%. Let's go ahead and remesh it. This calculation should take a lot less time, simply because it's working on 70,000 polygons instead of, oh no, did I just crash it? Okay, good. <laughs> I thought I crashed it for a second. <laughs> Hello, welcome. Welcome to the live stream. If you have any questions about 3D stuff, modeling, animation, augmented reality, visual effects, real time stuff, um, this is the place to ask. Cool, we're at 96% reduced polygon. Please work this time. In the last live stream, we ran into some troubles with my remesher tool where it would get stuck kind of like what it's doing right now. It would get stuck at 96% and not go past it. 
So I'm hoping that it works this time because we have 75% less polygons. So I assume it should take 75% less time to remesh those polygons. But it looks like it's still calculating. I'm going to abort that remesh. Uh, let's go ahead and reset this. Maybe let's put this down to like, I don't know, maybe, maybe it likes to have a lot less polygons. So what if we set this to like 12,000 for whatever reason, 12,000 polygons. No, that's a, that's not enough. Uh, let's do 25,000. One, two, three zeros. Remesh this. Let's see if we have any luck. It's doing some math here, calculating some adaptive resolutions. It's thinking, it's thinking. There it goes, it's remeshing. Hello. Uh, today we are working on the attack on Titan Titan. I'm trying to model this so that we can bring it into some really cool visual effects, tell some stories with this gigantic monstrous creature. And yeah, I think it will be fun. But uh, I finished modeling it in a free program called ZBrush Core Mini. And now we're just, oh wow, look, it did remesh. Cool, let me take a look. So we've remeshed it, and you lose a lot of details, but at least this model is a lot easier to paint, and also a lot easier to unwrap, which makes it better. So what we can do in, in our other program is we can do a method called projection mapping, and we can project the quality of the high resolution one, we can project the high resolution onto our other one, as a normal map and by projecting it on we'll get the best of both worlds so what you see in light gray is the low resolution one and what you see in dark gray is the high resolution model and that's all you need if you have a high res and a low res model and they have the same UVs you can bake one onto the other and and it's really cool so let me save my project now that we have this data so I'm gonna go to save project boom 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 great it's saved and next, I'm going to get rid of the layers I don't need. So I'm going to rename one of them, too. So this one, we're going to call this the high-res model. So high-res. And then for this one, we're going to call this the low-res model. We want to paint the low-res model, but have it look like the high-res model. This is a hack that game developers have been doing since forever. As long as there's been 3D gaming, uh, there ha this is a hack they do to get more quality out of a lower quality asset. They project the high quality asset as a texture onto the low um, quality one. That way it loads much faster, but you don't have to worry about other things. So I'm gonna get rid of all the other geometry that's in here. It's just wasting space, so I'm gonna get rid of it. Cool. Um, and then also gonna, I'm gonna set a color code for each. So just to make it clear for us, I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna do a bright pink for the high resolution because I think of like a bright color, it's like, it's like a high color. And I'm gonna call that high res in pink. And then in a darker pink, almost a purple color, uh, we'll put that onto the other model and we'll call that one, I'll make it darker too. That'll be our low res model. Even that looks kind of cool right away, but that's not the effect I'm trying to do. But yeah, so that's the darker pink or purple, whatever. And then I'm gonna call that my low res. All right, so now we got to do is save out each of these models as its own file, and then when we bring them into Substance, we'll be able to have the ability to paint on the low-res model, which saves memory and time, but it will hopefully get it close to the look of the high-res model. That's the whole point of doing this, this two-step process. So let me hide the, um, the high-res model for a second. So this is the high-res one in pink. I'm going to select our Titan here, and then... Uh, just for the time being, I'm going to copy it and put it into a new project. We won't see it for a, mo for a moment because the scale of this other project is, is a different size. So I'm going to change the project settings so that we are able to see it. Oh, I don't see it at all. Where is it? Oh, weird. It didn't copy at all. Let me try it one more time. I'm going to copy my high-res model and I want to paste it into this scene. Oh, there it is. Okay. So this is our high-res model. Oh, it's placed in a really weird spot. Let me undo that. Let me take both of these guys in the earlier model and place them in a better spot in 3D space so that we're not like occluding to the ground plane like this. So I'm gonna grab my low-res model and my high-res model. They're both aligned with each other. One's dark, one's light. And I'm just gonna, oops, 
I want to move both. So I'm going to grab both of them and put... Why can't I grab both of them? <laughs> oh, there we go. So I'm going to grab both of them and make sure that we're in a solid front projection to make sure that he's aligned in the center axis. There we go. So that's right on the floor. And let's take a look at a side view. Uh, it thinks this is the right view, and it's not. I think he's facing backwards. So I'm going to rotate him 180 degrees this way. So now he's oriented in the correct direction, and he's on the ground plane, and we have our two different res models. So we have the high res model in pink, and we have the low res model in purple. And what we need to do is we need to, we need to use one to project onto the other. It's going to be really cool, if I can get this to work. So I'm going to go ahead and save this project again. And we're going to copy the high-res model, which is made out of triangle. So I'm going to copy it, go to a new project over here, and then paste it. There it is. So there's our high-res Titan. And we can save this as an object file. So I'm going to go to File, Export, Object. And they need to be the exact same size. So I'm going to set this one to 100 centimeters. Hit OK. We're going to call this high-res. Um, Titan underscore high underscore res. And then we're going to go to the other one. Where is it? Window. And we're going to delete the high res model so that we're just left with the low res model. And you can see it's much lower resolution. We, we have so, so many fewer polygons. But that is okay. You know, that's totally cool. We want that. Um, and now what we're going to do with this one is go file, export, set this as an object set this as well to 100 centimeters and we'll call this one low res, uh, Titan low res so let me grab my Titan high res wherever it is and we'll call this oh wait 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 I, I named this poorly where where am I where am I going to go with this oh there it is we're gonna call this Titan low res all right great so we hit save Okay, so with these two files, we can now go into Substance Painter. Uh, ignore this one. This one had some problems. I started working on it earlier, so we're going to delete it, pretend it didn't exist. We're going to go into OpenGL, and I'm going to grab the Titan Low Res model. There it is. And we're going to do an automatic unwrap experimental and hit OK. And I'll discard the previous one. Cool. So it tries to unwrap this model. It's low res. It's fine. And now what we're going to do is try to bake in the high quality texture on top of this. Um, oh, a uh, question from Violet, Violent Burrito says, how are you doing? He is making a game question mark. Uh, hello, I'm doing fine. And um, uh, I'm just making an asset for a visual effect shot that I have in mind. I want to have a giant Titan um, walking through my cities. So I have some footage I shot with my iPhone. And I want to have a giant titan in one of these shots uh, that scares the people of the land. I don't know which shot I want to use yet. But in one of these the world, shots, I shot these on the iPhone. Where augmented and reality the takes over your life. In the world interacting with it. So we've modeled the titan from scratch. And now we're starting the process of painting the titan so that it looks realistic and stuff. Cool. So we're going to go to the mode on the top and go to bake mesh maps. And this is where you can import an image file, or sorry, you can import the 3D model. So I'm going to import a, two, a 1K resolution, and we can find the high polygon mesh. And there it is. There's the high res Titan. Sorry, Titan high res is what I called it. There it is. So that's the one that has all the really cool details. And we're going to hit open. And I'm going to bake in the texture. So let's see if it works. So right now it's trying to bake the high resolution. Wow, it totally worked. Oh my goodness. That was so fast too. You see that? So take a look. Now, I mean, there's some issues with the lip there, but we can probably fix that with paint. Um, but now we essentially have the high resolution model is baked onto the low resolution model. So this is actually a low res asset, but it's got the high quality details. That's the point of making those two models. Uh, if you want to see them better, let me see if I can turn on my display options. Uh, display, where is the polygon mode? Show wireframe. So now you can see that we're only painting a few polygons, but look at how many more details we get. Uh, it's kind of hard to see. Let me rotate the camera so it's dark. There we go. So you see how there's only a few polygons in the face? 
yet we're getting like all those extra details in the nose. That's because we baked the high res texture. We baked the high res model as a texture on the low res model. This is a secret that's been used in the game industry since the beginning of 3D. And it's still a very useful thing to do today. All right, so now that our character's like this, let me see what happens if I try to paint him. So let me just go ahead and grab a fill color here. I'm gonna grab a brand new random red color. I'm gonna add a black mask and see what happens if I paint across. Okay, it looks like the painting is working. The arms are still problematic. So they're not unwrapped very nicely. The, uh, the auto algorithm did not unwrap the arms very prettily. So what I might do differently then is maybe go back to Cinema 4D one more time and I might just do an, um, I might do an unwrap manually myself here. So, because I don't, I don't like the way it unwrapped my model uh, in, their auto, in their automatic algorithm. So uh, I'm in the version here and I'm going to go set this to the UV editor mode. UVs are like the wrapping paper of your 3D model. Would you be able to make a game? Definitely. Because all the same tools, I would use the same workflow. And even the programming logic isn't as scary as it used to be in the distant past. Okay, so here's the model, and what we need to do is create an unwrap of our character. So I'm gonna select our character here, and I'm gonna go to the line tool, and I'm gonna try to draw a line where I want it to be unwrapped. It's not gonna be perfect at all, but I just need to start drawing the seams where I want my character model to be cut. Uh, I don't really plan on showing his back too much, so it's okay if the seams are kind of garbage. <laughs> so there we go, there's a seam. And now we can, with that seam, you can go to the unwrap tool and it will unwrap your model. All right, so there you go. So now you see how it unwrapped the back? So that white line here is literally this white line on its back. And when you add seams to your, sorry, when you add seams to the 3D model's surface, it allows you to um, unwrap it better, which makes it easier to paint. So I'm gonna add another seam here. So we're gonna go to our line selection mode I'm holding shift, I'm adding another seam down the side of the arm here. And you can see what it did is it put a seam along that side there on the UV coordinates. See that seam right there? And now if I run the unwrap on the unwrap algorithm again, but what it's doing is it's gonna try to make that, it's gonna unwrap these two sides. So it's gonna kind of push this side to the side and it's gonna push this side to the other side. There it goes, so it's already looking better. So now the arm is unwrapped. And what you do is you kind of just add seams to your model. And um, you want to make them so that they're friendly for you as an artist to paint later. So I want to put a seam right there. I'm also going to put a seam down the back of the leg if possible. This is a really like dirty model in the sense that it's the topology is not very clean. I'm just using like the default unwrap algorithms. So I'm just kind of drawing some seams here where I want it to cut the model so that it's easier for me to paint. I'm also gonna use the loop selection tool. Oh, we don't have good loops, do we? All right, there we go. So we have some loops for the arm. So if you make a full ring cut like that around a part, it will turn it into its own paintable island. So I'm just gonna make some little cuts right there. And I also am gonna put a, a seam underneath the beard here so that it's easier for me to paint the beard separately from the rest of the body and just the upper body hair. So you get all these weird little orange lines. Um, I don't know if I can make an awesome game, not by myself, I would need help. And so now I'm gonna go ahead and unwrap the algorithm again. Um, I do have a lot of friends that are game designers, so it, they could totally, it could totally be a thing. Um, but as of now, I would say I couldn't do a game by myself. So this is looking pretty good. We got some new unwraps. We also have some new problems. So you see how this area right here is super dense with polygons? These are gonna be really hard to paint. So we need to keep adding seams onto our model until everything is pretty evenly spread out so that it's not a nightmare to paint. That's what it's all about. You, you just wanna make it so that you're not painting a nightmare. You wanna have fun when you're doing your 3D painting. You don't wanna be crying. You can easily cry uh, when you're painting in 3D. It can be very frustrating when you don't know this stuff but I'd rather not cry later and just go through the, you know, the extra steps 
right now. It's like right now I'm just trying to find a good seam for the uh, to cut the leg on. Oh, there we go. That's a good one. It's a nice straight one across the leg here. Let me see if there's another one here. Great. So I'm just going to cut the legs there. Awesome. Awesome. And I might connect these lines together if I can. I'm doing another seam here. And we'll do another seam over there. Cool. And now let's run the unwrap algorithm again. Again, we're creating the wrapping paper. Think of this really as the wrapping paper. Oh, have a good one. Bye-bye. Um, think of this really as the wrapping paper for your 3D model. Ah, oh, that looks so much better. Yay. That's going to be a lot easier to paint for me. Uh, okay, this is a weird line. I don't know what that is. I f unless it... Yeah, I don't know what line that is. Oh, I see what it is. It's the beard. Um, we might need to do one more cut uh, with this part here. So I'm just going to cut the line around the beard here and try to get this to go around the back of the head just so it's like out of the way. And then we can bring that back around following the contours of the beard here. Okay, so cool. That's a pretty good seam. I think that will cut out the head pretty nicely from the rest of the body and give it its own space to be, you know, worked on. Uh, I also sometimes like to add cuts behind the ears, but we don't really see the ears, so it's fine. Alright, so let's just go ahead and run the unwrap algorithm again. Cool, letting it do its math thing. All right, looking good. We got a separate head now, which is great. So now I got all these nice clean islands to paint instead of this nightmare that it was before. And with these clean islands, we'll be able to paint our model with a lot more ease and a lot less anxiety. Um, I think the only thing that's looking a little bad here is this, this part looks really too dense to me. So I might want to reduce that density, and you already know what you got to do. We have to add more seams if you ever want to reduce, you know, any issues. So I'm gonna take, I'm gonna go to the top of the character's head and try to add a seam there. Um, it, yeah, again, it's not gonna be perfect, not even, not even close to perfect, um, <laughs> as you can see here. But I can at least get a little bit less distortion on the face if we're able to get the hair cut to there. So let's go ahead and run the unwrap algorithm again on the map texture. UV unwrap. Let's see what it does to the hair. Okay, that's actually much better. So now the head is, there's a lot less distortion on the face. And I think we're ready to paint now that we have these islands. So I'm going to go ahead and save the project. And what it's going to look like is it's going to look the same here. But now we have all these things called the UV islands made. And so with the UV islands, we have the ability to like, I mean, that's really everything. So now look at that. We have a whole section for just the body. We have a whole section for the arm, whole section for this arm, whole section for the leg, this leg, and then a whole section for the face. And these UVs are going to be what we paint in our other 3D programs. Um, only area I see a problem for now are actually the hands. Looks like there's a lot of textile density in the hands. So what I'm going to do is fix that right now. We're going to go into our polygon selection mode, grab the hand here, and grab our UVs. And I'm going to make a loop cut around the wrist on both arms. So that's one cut over there. And then we'll do another cut around the wrist over here. Oops, wrong one. Right there. There we go. Great. That's going to help a lot with distortion. And then while we're at it, I'm going to also make some little cuts for the fingers a tiny bit. Nothing crazy, but we're just going to add a couple more seams down the sides of the fingers just so it has a little bit more space to unwrap without distorting. Cool, so just add some seams down the back of the fingers. Um, I am no expert when it comes to seams at all, but I'm learning. And I generally know that you want to hide seams down the spots that clothing people put seams on clothing. That's a general rule of thumb. 
All right, we're going to unwrap that algorithm again, see how the fingers come out. Okay, that's much better. Now that now the fingers are splayed out so that we can actually paint them with ease. And I think we're all good to go with the low res model. We have a low res model that's all UV unwrapped and I'm going to save it. So go to save project. Cool. And then we're going to export it as the low res. So we're going to go export wavefront object. I'm going to make sure it's 100 centimeters just like our high res model and we'll call this low res version 2. Low res Titan uh, version, I'll call it version 3 because I think I have a version 2 already. Cool, let's open up Substance Painter one more time and we'll go to File New. We're going to erase the other one. We'll set this to 2K resolution. I'm going to grab our low resolution model, which we just named Low Res Titan version 3. And we'll do all that goodness. Great, we'll hit OK. I'm going to discard the previous one. So look at that. Now our model is here with our UV tiles, so it'll be much easier to paint. And now we need to project the high resolution model onto here, I think, if we can. I haven't tried this before yet. So let's go to um, uh, Edit, Bake Mesh Maps, and I'm going to grab the high res model, high, uh, high res, Titan high res, there it is, and hit Open. I'm going to up the resolution here to 2K and see if we can bake the maps. All right, looks like it's working so far. We're getting a lot more resolution at, wow, there it is. Now this is a game ready asset, even though we're not making it for a game, but you could actually work for a game now. Uh, uh, while it's saved here, while it's looking good, I'm going to just save this file because we're now at a really good spot. I'm going to call this ready to paint. just finished modeling our character and we finished painting him got his materials exported here so that's what the character is going to look like in terms of texture textures um, but now <laughs> we need to unfortunately reopen this thing that just crashed <laughs> and retrack it so I want to use this footage right here I'm going to drag this in and we're going to make a new composition from the selection Cool. So this is the footage that I want to track. And I just go in here to the effects and presets and I look for the 3D camera tracker. And we just drag that onto our footage. And it's going to analyze your footage and depending on the length it's going to take some time to create a 3D solvable point cloud of your data. So just give it some time. This one's going to be pretty fast though because it's very low res and um, it's a short video. So we're already about 20% of the way done, but I might just jump ahead here in a second. Okay, I'm back. I got some snacks. I'm gonna eat a little bit of it. But here we have some 3D tracking points. If you can't see them, I like to go to my target size and increase the scale of them. Sorry, not the target size. Let me undo that. I like to increase the track point size. And then we kind of just play the footage to see how good the track is. Now, if you don't see your tracks and they, and they disappear, you also need to check on render track points. That way, when you play it, you'll get to see your colorful tracking data oh my God. while you're working, and you'll know whether or not you got some good solves. What you look for is points that stay on consistently throughout the frame, because those are the ones that you want to isolate. So these are all looking really good. There's lots of good points in contrast to track. So what I like to do is um, decrease my target size to kind of be smaller. And uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, yeah, click on these three here. Right click and do create solid and camera. And now you'll see that that plane is gonna stay locked into place. And I like to just add a bunch of these, really. I just kind of go through my footage and I look for different points that are gonna be useful at telling me the size and scale of things. So like right here is a good one. I'm gonna do create solid. Great, and keep selecting your footage, keep uh, selecting your 3D camera tracker and adding more. So I just keep clicking on these, creating solids. Let's save our work this time <laughs> so I don't lose it in case it crashes. So I'll save this into the Titan folder and I'll call this camera underscore data. 
awesome. We'll go back to our 3D camera tracker and just keep, you know, scrolling through it, looking for nice high contrast points like this. For this one, I might increase the size of my target and do create solid. Awesome. Let's do the same thing over here. Looking good, create a solid, awesome, let's do the same thing. And it's just this rhythm of clicking on your layer, clicking back on that 3D camera tracker and finding the, the area that has some good 3D data for you to, um, to, to track. And you can keep playing your footage. Um, in general, this tracker only works if the camera is moving. So if you're, if you're having a lot of stopping and going motion when you're trying to do a camera solve for visual effects, it's going to be a really hard shot to track. It's going to be kind of tedious. And, and what that means is when you bring your 3D assets in, your CGI, it might be sliding around a bit, which is distracting. Unless it's your goal, if you're trying to make it look bad, you can do that, you know, if you're trying to go for like a goofy look. But you don't really usually want those sliding artifacts. So I'm just going through it and just looking for more clips, more little bits over here. Like these are some cool points. Um, be careful for reflections because reflections move against reality. So I try to track things that are very matted, like this building here, this kind of concrete texture. Um, ground planes usually do pretty well, but this car is kind of screwing up with the tracking data. So I don't know if I want to actually grab those points. Um, but my rule of thumb is you can't really go wrong with adding more points to reference. Another good rule of thumb is I try to have some objects in the far background and other objects pretty close in the foreground. That way I get a pretty good like map later on of the scale of my scene. Like, you know, I might even put something as close as we can to the camera here. Even, even though I don't like to track the cars, we could because there's some points in here. I'll just create a solid over there and just keep looking around for more points. We can also reduce the target size, or sorry, the tracking size if they're kind of getting in the way. So I can maybe grab this plane. I'll actually decrease the target size as well. That way we have a nice little guide for where the start of the, in, uh, if the experience is going to be. I'm going to grab these points here. Looks like some good tracking points. And uh, I'm trying to avoid the ones with the shadows of the car because those ones are going to constantly move. But these three aren't. So I'm going to create a solid there. And you see that as you hover your mouse around, it looks for, it tries to make a, a triangle, which is all it takes to make a plane. You need three points to define a plane. And as soon as it finds three points, it tries to snap to a grid. But I think, I mean, this might look a little excessive, and honestly, it probably is a bit excessive, but I like to be very thorough because I don't want to have to keep going back and adjusting this and trying to find better points. Uh, I want it to be, I basically want it to work right when I bring it in to the next program. And the best way to do that is if you just give it all the data that's useful for you so that as a motion designer or an animator, you're able to just kind of focus on what matters and not have to come back here. Um, but once you have a bunch of different colorful things and your piece is looking like a rainbow full of all these solids, this is when it's now safe to bring it into the next program, uh, which in this case, I'm just looking for a few more points here. <laughs> okay, so great, we have all these points. You need to do two things now. First thing we need to do is we need to extract this 3D data. So I like to hide my visual layer so that you're just left with your 3D points. Uh, your 3D planes, and that's awesome. And you can go to File, and you have to choose um, Export as a Maxon Cinema 4D Exporter. It's a super important step. So I'm going to click on that and hit OK. And then we'll save this into the Beast Titan folder. I'm going to call this Tracked Data. And save it. That's the first of two steps. The second step is you need to convert your video into a sequence of either JPEGs or PNGs. What does that even mean and why? Well, here's why. Uh, here's my footage. I'm going to turn off my tracking points, so it's just this regular footage again. And the reason why we need to extract this and turn this into a sequence of images is a lot of 3D programs, including Cinema 4D and Blender, they don't like working with movie clips as much as they like to work with sequences of images. 
So I'm going to convert this into a sequence of images by selecting it, going to edit, sorry, going to file, export, and we're going to go ahead and add this to the render queue. Uh, that's actually one option. I'm going to delete that. Uh, change my mind. I'm going to do it a different way. I'm going to select my footage, go to file, export, and we're going to add this to the media encoder queue. Um, I find media encoders just a bit friendlier when it comes to exporting options. It gives you a lot more options as well. All right, so we have Media Encoder open now. I'm going to change this to a PNG, which automatically makes it a sequence of PNGs. It's an image file format. And then we want to save this into a good spot. So I guess I'll put in my camera tracking data. I'm going to make a new folder in here. I'm going to call this camera footage sequences, or SE, or SQ is fine. And I'm going to save it in here. Cool. And then we hit play. And then it's going to basically convert each one of the frames of your video into a PNG. You totally need this for visual effects. Once you're done tracking your footage in After Effects and extracting a PNG sequence, we can open up our Cinema 4D file. So in my case, it's right here under my quick access. So I can just double click to open up Cinema 4D with my tracked data. All right, so here it is. So now what you have is all of those tracking points from earlier and a 3D camera. And this is amazing because now you're in a fully 3D program and you have access to all the powerful tools. And this also gives you an understanding of the scale. So let me jump out of our camera and you can see the scale of our scene of what it thinks the scene is. Pretty neat, right? So now, we need to bring our footage in. So what I like to do is make a new image layer, a new material, and we just turn on the color and change the texture to um, load an image. And we're going to go into our file in here, Beast Titan, camera tracking. Here's our camera footage. And you just need to grab the very first frame and hit open. And then hit no. Then you have to do a couple more things. We dive into it. We choose animation. And we click on cal calculate, which then grabs all the frames. Finally, we go to the viewport and we change it to animation preview. And now we have a texture that should work fine. Uh, cool, but you're not going to see it yet because that's why we need a background image. So I'm going to click on here and add a new background image. And then we're going to fill this um, footage as the background. Uh, sometimes you won't see it right away, so I might just drag it around to the background here. And if we return to our camera, everything should be set. Now if you see the resolution is super low, uh, that happens all the time. You can just click on this footage, set the viewport to no scaling. And then you're getting the full quality PNG sequence playing in here with your tracking points. And I like to kind of just play it through and just double check that everything is looking pretty aligned. And in this case, I think it totally is. So let's just save our project. All right, so now the next phase is we bring in our 3D model. Um, our 3D model right now is, does not have animation on it though. But that's okay, we can at least still start lighting our scene and stuff. So, what I'm gonna do is find our 3D model and place them in the scene. Or should we just bring the animation in? I'm not sure. Uh, I guess I'll just do the model for now. So, we're gonna go ahead and go to File, Merge. And what we look for is the low resolution model that we made earlier. So I think I called it Titan Low Res Version 3. Titan Low Res Version 3. There it is. Awesome. And we hit open. And I'm going to set the scale to 100 centimeters. We'll probably need to change this. Cool. There's the model. We can play it forward. You can see where it lives in 3D space. Pretty neat. It's cool that it just like loads in the middle there. And now what we need to do is give it the texture that we made it initially. So uh, there's the texture that it wants to feed it. And we're going to go into the color. 
Oh, actually, just kidding. We're gonna let's actually delete that color. Um, we're gonna apply the texture using Redshift. So I'm gonna make a brand new Redshift uh, material. So I'm gonna go to um, Filter or something. Uh, Redshift materials. Where am I? Uh, Redshift. There it is. Materials, and we'll click on Create Material. <clears throat> I'm gonna drag this material onto our character. And then we're gonna dive into this um, panel. And what we need to feed it is all your textures that we wrote out from Substance Painter. So I dive into here, I go straight to my Beast Titan, and there's my material folder called an MTL. And these are all the materials that we need. Uh, we have this one, which is just the glowing eyes. This one, which is the roughness map. This is the normal map. This is the metallic. I think I might, I might have mixed up my roughness from metallic, but they're very similar. And then we have our height field, if we want to displace height, and we have color. So what I do is I just grab all of these and drag them in. You'll have to hit enter a bunch of times. One, two, three, four, five, I think, or six times. And now you get all these little nodes, and these are all of your image. Excuse me, these are all of your images. And now uh, we need to feed these images into the Redshift material, and then this will output to the surface of that material, which we also applied to that character. So let's do it. I'll start off with the most clearly easy one to see, which is the uh, the um, just the regular color. So I'm going to send the output of this into the input here and make this the base diffuse color. It will take a second to update up there, but this will make the this will give us the color of our material. So we see that we got that going for us. Awesome. Next, I'm going to take my uh, emission color and send that in there and add it to the property of our emissive channel. If I can find the emissive channel, there it is, overall emission color. So I'm just going to put that there. This will allow us to get the glowing eyes once it uploads and populates there. It's still working. Um, then we have our roughness map. I'm going to feed this into here as well and feed this as the uh, the coding, the base roughness. So there's a base refraction, there's a reflection roughness amount. And there's a metalness one. We're going to grab that one, feed it into there as well. We'll make this the advanced base metallic if we can find it as well. It should be in here. Uh, if not, I might just end up doing like reflection weight if I can't find a better option. I don't. Oh, the reflection metalness will work better. There we go. Great. We have two more. We have a normal map and a height field. The normal map is the weirdest one with Redshift. We have to first get a node that converts it. So I look up the word bump, and there's a bump map node. And we have to first feed our normal map as an input texture onto our bump map. And now we feed this bump map into our Redshift material as the overall bump input. Now that this is all wired up, now that this is all wired up, <coughs> excuse me, we can uh, close that. And I can click on the real-time viewer here, and you'll get to see your model in all of its glory. And this is in real-time, so we can even play the animation, and you'll see that it kind of stays there locked in the plane. Pretty cool. And this one, you get all those textures. The last one that we need to add is the height field, and that's if we want to add, like, separate, you know, height pass to our model so that it's like bumpy. So I'm going to grab the height and input that there, go to the overall. Uh, I never use height in here, so actually I don't know where it goes. Let me see if I could find it. Um, overall, no. Hmm. Maybe that's thickness. Let me try it as thickness. Uh, it doesn't look like that did anything. Let me undo that. We might need to convert it, so let me see if height is an option. H E I G H T. I don't see it. Huh. Displace. Oh, maybe it's called displacement. Let me see if we can find this. We have diffuse, reflection, transmission, coding. Maybe coat bump input. 
No. I don't know where to where to bring this. Um, bump, 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 bump. We have our normal map in there, but okay. Well, the next thing we need to do is we need to bring lights into our scene. So I use this really silly trick. Uh, I go to my redshift materials. I go to add a redshift dome light. Looks pretty wild. It's just a white infinite light that goes around your scene. Uh, but then the next thing I do, which is kind of cool, is um, I replace the color here with the background texture. Which now I'm thinking about it, we probably need to make that in Redshift as well. So let's go to Material or create a new Redshift material. I'm just going to call this Material. And then we're just going to grab our um, PNG sequence. Actually, I don't remember how to do that. Maybe we can just do it here as the color. Is there a basic option? Let's see what happens if we just try to make it uh, the dome light color. So I'm going to go to my dome light. And for the dome map, I'm going to add a path to that PNG sequence from before. Uh, it says this image is not in the projection search path. Do I'm just going to hit no. Uh, cool, so now it's using the lighting from our actual footage to light our scene, which makes it look a lot more realistic. And um, you can see it yourself. It's getting a lot more realistic lighting into the same shot. What's cool too is we can take our dome light now and actually rotate it around to find the most ideal like lighting situation. I try to recreate the lighting um, as properly as possible. You know, it's never going to be perfect, but we can at least get it close. Cool, so now we have some pretty good lighting on our character. And now I jump out of that camera, and now we need to make the character the scale of a titan. So I'm going to grab our titan here, and go to the coordinate scale. I'm going to scale it up by 100 times. Cool. Cool. That might be too big, but I don't know yet, so let's just put that back here in the back of the scene and then return to our camera. Okay. And next we need to also hide the dome map from uh, appearing in our viewer here. Uh, I forgot how to do that, but I will learn right now. So let's see. If we turn it off, we get no lights though, so I do want to keep it on somehow. Let's see if we got our... Usually there's a redshift tag, a redshift object tag, and we can do an override. And I want to make this not visible in the camera somehow. So we want reflections, cast shadows, all good. Um, I don't know where to turn off the field though. Primary visible, 